All right, so today we're doing examples of just about whatever. Uh, I'm going to spend, by default, a lot of time on encodings and show you really what UTF-8, uh, ASCII, and images, uh, the encodings are all about and talking about bytes most of the time. If you have other things you want to see, please let me know. Uh, if I get through all of the encoding stuff, I'm going to go back to that database example I showed very quickly at the end of last lecture, uh, which you can go back and watch the video if I don't get to it today uh, and you know slow that down and take a look at what I'm doing. But that's what I plan to, to get to today if we get through all the encoding stuff. So let's hop over to Visual Studio Code and talk about character encodings. Uh, since this is a demo lecture, just like Wednesdays and whenever we have a demo lecture like this, if you have questions, please let me know, because I'm just going to go through my default thing of encodings. Maybe you all already know about encodings. Uh, you should all be through objectives one through three by now, uh, which is where the encodings really kick in. So if, if that's true and everybody's done with that and nobody cares about encodings, let me know and I'll show you. Uh, I was kind of freestyle a demo on something else. So let me know. I have the chat open, of course, uh, or just raise your hand and be like, yo. Uh, preferably chat if you're suggesting a topic, because then everybody can react uh, with emojis and I can see if something's really popular. So with that, let's talk about encodings. <laughs> My brain's got to shift gears here quite a bit. Uh, so I have this method here, show encodings, and I'm going to give this a variety of inputs and just show what the encodings are for these strings. So when we do this, first, I just want to see what the string is. And take the string, or sorry, not what the string is. Yeah, what the string is, x. Encoding x, but assigning a new variable. Uh, what the string is, just as a string, there shouldn't be any surprises. That's exactly how it shows up later down in this file. How it shows as a UTF-8 encoded string, so this, when we encode using UTF-8, what we're doing is taking a Python string, in this case, or the string of whatever language you have, and converting it into a, an array of bytes. We're taking the string and saying, encode this as just ones and zeros. Each specific language might have a completely different way of encoding a string, usually as a sequence of bytes at some level. Uh, but with some overhead, it'll be an actual object in most languages, or uh, an array of characters, but also with some overhead, some extra methods and things uh, attached to it. When we encode it, we're saying, nah, just give me the bytes. Just the bytes. Just the ones and zeros as a byte array. So we want to see what the bytes are for this string. And then I'm going to print it in a few different ways, in decimal, hex, and binary, to see what those bytes represent. So for the ASCII characters, we expect this to coincide exactly with our ASCII chart. I'm going to print out the values in the encoded, so I'm iterating over the bytes, and print them as decimal numbers, just base 10. I'm going to print them as hex values using hex, convert it to a hex value, and then print it out. And then finally, as a binary value, what are the actual ones and zeros that are being sent over the internet? What are those ones and zeros? Uh, and just to visualize things, it's the same value, it's the same eight ones and zeros, it's the same byte every single time, but just representing in different ways. Now, most of the time, so all of the time, computers represent things in binary, but most of the time, by default, like this, I just used print, the computer is going to convert that to base 10 for us humans to consume. We like base 10, we got 10 fingers, so we uh, built all of our numbering system based on base 10. Uh, it's just the way we humans do it. The computer is always seeing this binary, though. Uh, so it's the same value. I'm not changing the value. I'm just converting the way it's represented in either hex or binary digits. And then finally, hopefully you all internalize this uh, pretty deeply. But another reminder, the length of the string not always equal to the number of bytes representing that string after it's encoded. So I want to print those values out and just a, a blank line to separate the examples. So let's go through these. I'm in, oh, I'm in a different directory. I'm in my servers. Uh, encodings, Python 3 character. So let's run this thing and see what we get. And then the example is way at the bottom. I'll 
I'll go through those ones in a second. So first input, hello. We're going to print it as a string. We just get hello. We'll print it as you, a byte encoded. This is how Python is going to represent its byte arrays. Python, again, the computer likes to help us out a lot. So not just converting things to base 10, like our integers, it's always going to display those as base 10 unless we specify otherwise. But also our characters. Our, even though these are just bytes, Python's going to assume, a pretty strong assumption in some cases, it's going to assume that these bytes represent characters. So if a byte, any byte, ever in your code represents an ASCII character, if the most significant bit is zero, and it is a valid ASCII character, then it's going to print it as a character. So even though this is a byte array, or rather a byte string, uh, when you encode them like this, it's going to print those ASCII characters uh, as ASCII characters, even though this is a byte array. You can also use this notation in Python if you want to write a byte array directly. Put this B, and then the characters, and that'll create a byte array or a byte string in Python uh, directly. Then finally, our decimal values. Look up your ASCII chart. These decimal hex and binary should match exactly with the characters H, E, L, L, and O. Uh, you can verify that. I'm not going to pull up the chart. Sometimes I do in this lecture, but uh, you'll have to take my word for it today because we lost five minutes at the beginning here. Uh, so H. E, L, L, O. If we want to print those as hex values to get a little closer to how these are actually represented in the machine, we can get the hex values for these. I assume you've all seen hex extensively in at least one other course, right? Uh, probably 341. I think you see a lot of hex. 220. I think you see some. Um, that I don't have to go into these. I don't think I do. But this is the ones place. This is the 16th place. It's just base 16. And we say OX to represent, to say, hey, what you're about to see is a hex value. So just in case there's no A through F in the specific value that you're printing, uh, so say this was, do I even have one right here? 65. We put the OX there to say, hey, this is a hex 65. It is not base 1065. This is actually the number 101 in base 10. So we put the OX just to avoid any confusion. OX, you're looking at hex. OB, you're looking at binary. And we'll see the same values as binary, uh, binary values. When, in a, uh, I'll say most, uh, in most languages, when you print out values, bytes as binary, it will truncate any leading zeros. So these are bytes. They are eight bits. I guarantee they are eight bits. Uh, but since there's a leading zero on all our ASCII characters, we're not seeing that leading, uh, leading that most significant bit. Uh, it is a zero. It is truncated, unfortunately. I, I wish languages didn't do that by default. You had to do some extra work to display leading zeros. Uh, the leading spirit zeros are, are truncated when they're printed to the screen. But they do exist. I think it's misleading that it does that. but. Uh, my side of that argument didn't win. Can we see an example of how to hide our password for a database specifically when connecting to our database? Um, so it depends on exactly what you're talking about. Uh, when you're first connecting to your database, if you're doing this the way, ooh, I didn't even show a MySQL example in Docker, did I? Maybe that's what we can try to do on the fly at the end of this lecture. Uh, if you're doing it with Docker Compose with MySQL, and you have to have your username and password, put it right in your Docker Compose file as environment variables, and then read those environment variables in your code. That, that would be the way to do it. Uh, and then anybody who's deploying your app, the understanding would be that they should change that password in the Docker Compose file before they run the live production app. If you're using an outside database, you're using some database service, and you're connecting to that, and you want to hide your password, uh, you're completely wrong. Don't do that at all. Don't use that outside service. You have to use Docker Compose in this course. That's the only way I showed you how to set up a database in this course. Uh, that's the way you have to do it. Because um, the database itself isn't really a part of the content of the course. It's using Docker Compose. That's what I want you to know. 
spinning up two containers with Docker Compose and maintaining a network of two containers and having them communicate. Uh, so it does depend on what you're, what you're asking there. Uh, I know some of you were using Mongo Atlas. You can't do that on the homework. You got to set up with Docker Compose. Uh, and if you use MongoDB, as the next comment said, if you use MongoDB, you don't need the password. You don't have to worry about it at all. But if you're using MySQL, the setup is a little more of a pain. Uh, one, because you have to do this password thing. Um, and you can just have it in your Docker Compose file. Also interested in reviewing how to get JSON from the post body inserted into the database again. Uh, I mean, I didn't really show that completely, but you'll read the whole body of the request, convert it to a JSON string, and then call an insert into your database. Assuming you're using MongoDB. Again, if you're using MySQL, there's a little more overhead. You have to parse the JSON, get the exact values, and then insert them into your prepared statement. But yeah, MongoDB does make a lot, of, a lot of things a little easier. What is chunk encoding? To be honest, I don't even know. Chunk encoding. Encoding chunks. I've heard that before. What is that? I'll have to look it up. And then the length of our string. So every character was a single byte. Five bytes, five characters, because they're all ASCII. Length of the string, five. Byte length, five. It's all ASCII. String length is the number of bytes. Our, our next example, we have the string one quarter. as one single UTF-8 character. OK, this is non-ASCII. We're definitely outside of the realm of ASCII. ASCII is basically anything you could use for a password, uh, lowercase, uppercase letters, numbers, special characters, spaces, uh, carriage returns, uh, not much that we can represent there. Pretty much anything outside of what you can see on your keyboard is non-ASCII. So we have a UTF-8 character that's not ASCII, and we actually get, as a byte string, two values. Neither of these values map to any ASCII values, so we're not getting Python saying, here's the ASCII representation of this byte. Instead, we're getting the hex of that byte. So we get slash x. This is hex. Instead, I don't know why they don't do 0x, but uh, an escaped x, I guess. And then c2, which matches the bytes, and bc, which again matches the bytes. So we're getting this printed out as the actual bytes in hex is the actual representation we get. So again, just like we could do B and then in quotes hello to go directly to bytes with the character hello, if we type this, if we say x equals this exact what I have highlighted, type in that in your code, you'll get the character one quarter if you in, uh, decode that as a UTF-8 string. The decimal values. The hex values, I don't have much more to say to that than I already did on the previous example. Uh, but the binary, since this is a two-byte UTF-8 character, we expect the first byte to start with two leading ones and then a zero to indicate that this is a two-byte character. The first byte is always going to start with the number of leading ones equal to the number of bytes of that character. And then each subsequent byte is going to start with one zero. This is to prevent decoding errors. No UTF-8 character is a subsequence of another UTF-8 character. No characters at all start with one zero, because if it's a one byte character, it just starts with a leading zero, and it's the ASCII value. So every continuation byte starts with one zero, which cannot be the first byte of a character. It's always a continuation byte. So continuation bytes one zero, and then how many continuation bytes we expect significantly reduces decoding errors. If we have some bits that flipped when we were sent this over the internet or, or whatever happened, solar flares flipped a bit on us, uh, we're going to detect those errors in most cases. Or I shouldn't even say that. If, the, if one of these bits flipped, you just get the wrong character. But you're not going to get decoding errors. Or if you're gonna, getting a decoding error, you know that a decoding error happened. And you can request a recent. 
So it's a really nice feature of UTF-8. And finally, the length. We really have to see the code right now, right? The length, this is a one character string. Right after I say that, I want to reference the code. This is a one character string. The length of the string, one character. It's not giving you the number of bytes that are being sent over the internet. The length of the encoded string, after you encode this into bytes, two bytes. That's what we want for our content length. So when we encode this, remember the first thing we did, we have the string, and then we encode it using UTF-8. Or this can be blank encode defaults to UTF-8. If we do this, oops. If we delete that UTF-8, we'll get the same thing. Encode defaults to UTF-8 in most cases. If you want to be specific, um, adding it in ain't going to hurt anything. But in Python specifically, it defaults to UTF-8. It's not always the case for all languages, for all operating system systems. Windows still likes to default to some archaic encoding. I always forget what it is. It's some mix of letters and numbers, uh, the encoding name. Uh, so if you want to specify UTF-8 specifically, you'll avoid any potential issues there. Uh, but unencoded, the string, length of the string. Encoded, the number of bytes to represent that string in UTF-8. Let's go for a longer string. We have one quarter space euro, right? That's euro, right? Um, when we print this encoded, we get two bytes for the one quarter that we just had earlier, and then three bytes for the, the other symbol. It's going to be a three byte character. And then Python is trying to help us out the space. It's saying, oh, that's an ASCII character. Let me just represent, let me just show you the ASCII value of that, which is the space character, instead of showing us the bytes. Uh, but once we iterate over the bytes and display them, we're going to get that space character represented the way it actually is represented. So we can see our two byte uh, character that we saw before, two leading ones and a zero, then a leading one and zero on the continuation. For our three character, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero for the three bytes. Now our string length three, our byte size is double that at six. For our next character, another three byte character, one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, zero. We only have one character in the string, we got three bytes to represent that thing. And finally, a four byte character. We can have up to four bytes for a single character. Four bytes to represent this one, four leading ones, and then a zero for the leading bit. This is a four byte character, and then three continuation bytes. So the big punchline, the big takeaway we have to have in this class, compute the length after encoding. Make sure you're getting that byte length. If on this last example, if that's the one character you're sending over the internet, or you're sending this character, you know, a string with 100 of these characters, four byte length characters, you're only going to actually get a quarter of your data read by the browser. The browser is not going to read more bytes than your content length specifies. So if you have this as your content length, one, and this is the, a single character that you want to send, the browser is only going to read this byte. It's going to take your content length seriously. It's going to read that one byte and then get a decoding error and not display anything to your user. Bless you. And if you have UTF-8 or non-ASCII characters throughout your program and you're taking the string length, you're going to get some errors along the way, or you're just going to be missing the last part of your web page. If you have a lot of UTF-8 in your page, uh, you might be missing quite a bit at the bottom of your page because the browser's not going to read more than what you told it to read in the content length. Content length is the byte length, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And talk about storing passwords. All good stuff. Nicholas has you there. 
Yeah, I always like in the Docker Compose, all of my passwords I like to put in the Docker Compose if I'm not using a separate file, a separate config file. Uh, I'll put them right in Docker Compose to keep it simpler. And I'll just name all my passwords change me. There's a clear indication like, hey, don't use these in production. This is only for development. Don't use these in a prod environment. So we can specify the byte strings directly. If we just want to say what the bytes are and then print Y, we get this character. If you ever, for whatever reason, want to directly type UTF-8 characters in your code, just do it like this. So when you do this, this is saying create this as a byte array with these values and then decode the bytes as UTF-8. Just like you're decoding when you first receive the bytes over the TCP socket, you're always receiving bytes over the TCP socket. You can decode it as UTF-8, or you can write those bytes directly if you're so inclined for your responses instead of writing them as strings and then, uh, and then encoding them to send them. You can just go right into the world of bytes right away. Decode this as UTF-8, and we do get that character for the bytes that we, uh, we wrote. And just to show, it is the exact same character that we had before. ASCII is a subset of UTF-8. So if you have only ASCII characters and you encode it as ASCII, so I'm taking hello, encoding it as a byte string, encoding it as a byte array, using the ASCII encoding, not UTF-8, and then I want to decode it using UTF-8, that works just fine. Since it's all ASCII characters, if you have all ASCII characters encoding using ASCII or UTF-8, it's going to do the same exact thing, because ASCII is a subset of UTF-8. So this works. We get directly back to hello. And this, I don't know if this is useful for homeworks one or two, but I, I think I added this last semester during homework three and talked about it. But uh, if you want to get a specific bit out of a byte, you can use a logical and, and it with whatever, what we call a mask, whatever mask you want to use to filter. So here we have the byte, which is just eight ones. I'm going to mask it with a one, uh, Geez, I got to think now. I'm going to mask it with the one, two, four, eight. I'm going to mask it with this byte and then print it to the screen. So I'm going to do a logic bitwise and. That's just the single ampersand. That's why for logical ands in our conditionals, we have to use two ampersands. It's because single ampersand is already used for Boolean uh, bitwise, sorry, not Boolean, bitwise and. So I'm going to and it with this and then print to the screen. Instead of 255, we get 8 because we have exactly that byte. So we can do some binary manipulation in our code. We have this value, which is u, bitwise and with 8. The result is going to be 8, and that's what's printed to the screen. So if you want to pull a single bit out of a byte, you can mask it using a bitwise and and get the value you want. Uh, and for example, if we want to get maybe the four least significant bits, I'm going to and this with oops, 15, rerun this, and in this case, I expect 15 to be returned. Whereas if we don't if we don't mask it at all, we should get 255. So it's something we don't do much. It, it, it's kind of frustrating. We will do this. Maybe frustrating is the wrong word. Uh, in homework three, we'll, we will do some of this. But it's kind of, I'll say, annoying. In a lot of computer science classes, you learn about binary. You learn about bits and bit operations and all this stuff. But then you never use them when you're actually coding. 
It's like, why am I learning this? I want to be a software engineer. Uh, when we get to homework three, we actually will do a lot of this bitwise operations. When we get to WebSockets, WebSockets works at the bit level. We're going to escape from the byte level. We start at the string level. We move to the byte level. We're going to go down to the bit level and bit level manipulation when we get there. Uh, I always think that's fun because all that stuff you learn about um, bitwise operations and how ints are represented and all this stuff, you actually get to use that stuff. Uh, we don't have to do things like twos complement if that's uh, twos and ones complement. So if that scares you, like it scares me, I, I never remember how those things work. Uh, don't worry about that. But remembering that a byte is four bits, or four bits, eight bits, and that those bits uh, can be extracted individually and manipulated individually. Uh, we'll use bitwise and like this. We'll also use XOR for our needs. Can we see examples in JS? So I'm waiting for homework one. I, I will. I can do that. Uh, I'm waiting for homework one to be due so I can see how many of you are taking my advice and using Python and how many are using JavaScript. If there's still a decent bit of you using JavaScript, when I see the homework one submissions, uh, I'll start showing more JavaScript examples. Uh, but I'll show something quick. I mean, I have the uh, you know what? I, I could just use this example to talk about what I want to talk about, right? What do I got here? So the big thing in JavaScript is this buffer.from is going to be the same thing as encode in Python. Buffer.from is going to take your string or whatever and convert it to a byte array. So your buffers are your byte arrays in, um, in JavaScript. Uh, node bitmass. Why would it not put my JS? Oh, because I have a Python file. Identifier x is already declared. Sure. So. I can create my buffer on a character. I'm actually doing masking. This is an example for, for homework three stuff. So I'll try to talk about the stuff we want to know here. Let me just add to this code. Do I do the length? How do I not even do the length? Let's just ignore all this stuff. And and write our own example. I'll do a little live coding here. Uh, so say we want, say we have two values, oops, buffer dot from. Uh, let's even do it like this. Oh my goodness, I can't type today. Sure. So say we have These two values, we have two separate pieces of information coming from two different places, and we want to concatenate these together. That'll be the overarching thing that I want to do. Uh, we have the headers, which is just this symbol. Pretend those are headers. And the body of our request, or our response that we want to send back. Uh, first, I want to get the content length. Let's get a few of these in here. Uh, of this, beautiful variable names. Uh, Console dot log s dot length. Let's start off with showing the length of these. The length of my string. And then the length of my buffer, uh, I'm not going to count all these characters, but I expect the buffer to be 
six extra characters, six more characters than the string. Log log. Uh, don't have my keyboard shortcuts that I do in my IDE. Let's run this. Let's see what we get. Oh, four. Did I take the three byte character? I thought that was the four byte character. Yeah, it's a four byte character. How's that four extra? Uh, I don't know. I'm going to go, <laughs> just go with it though. Uh, so we need to do this buffer.from first, convert this to a byte array, and then get what we want to get. Let's log these, let's log the actual values as well instead of just the links. It's going to be bugging me. Why is that off by four instead of off by six? And we can see the actual bytes. So the, the string itself is just printing out the string. Cool. And then when we print out the byte array, we're getting the actual bytes, all the hex values for, uh, for this byte array. Okay, this is bugging me. I have to. Let's trim this all the way down. It, it, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it's looking like that. Because, yeah, we're getting the four here. So these are each two characters. They count as two characters as a string. That's interesting. Uh, but we do get our eight. Just those two characters is eight bytes. So the string, it's not what I would expect from the string. Uh, but we are getting the right byte length. So I'm happy about that. And then we want to concatenate these two together. So our whole response would be buffer.concat. No simple just plus sign here. We got to call a method. X and Y. That's spelled wrong. Console.log. Response. And then if we want to go from our bytes back to something that we care about, ooh. Line. Which line? Which line are you mad about? Concatenating? X, Y. Twenty-four, nineteen, invalid arg type. The list argument must be an instance of an array. Oh, had to cheat, but so you have to give an array of your your buffers. Dumb, but we'll do it. Does JavaScript not have um, deep packing stuff? So here we have, as a string, those bytes, we're converting them back to a string. Again, defaulting to UTF-8, because everything should use UTF-8 these days. And if we want to see the actual bytes, we can see that still as well. So if we have two things, like you're responding with an image and you're using JavaScript, you would read your image from the file, making sure it's in byte mode. You're going to typically read that as a byte array. You're not going to do buffer.from with that. But you have to concatenate it with a string. So with your string, you're going to have to convert that string into bytes using buffer.from, and then concatenate the bytes of your headers with your image to be able to get the values, uh, to get the entire response that you need. So I hope that answered the, the JavaScript question. We got some JavaScript in there today. Uh, 
And the last example I want to do, we won't get to the database stuff, unfortunately. Uh, but luckily, we got it in quickly at the last, uh, end of last lecture. Uh, copy in files. So I, I told you never, ever, ever convert your files, your uh, not files, your images into a string. So let's see what happens if you do. So I have this simple little program. I'm going to open an image. I have this twitch.png image, just the Twitch logo. And I'm going to open it. And I'm going to open it in read mode. And I'm going to open it in uh, binary mode. I'm just going to read the bytes of this file. This is very important. If you don't do that, it'll read it as a string and blow, blow everything up. So I'm going to read it as bytes. I'm just going to read all of the bytes of the file. I'm going to open a second file and write all the bytes to that file. So all I'm doing is copying a file, taking one file over here, reading all the bytes, writing all the bytes to another file, and that's it. And I'm going to save it as an image copy.png. Files. Copy.png, Twitch logo. Yay, everything's perfectly fine. So what would happen if we just delete one character? We get an error. Can't decode. Everything's broken. Uh, Python, so Node will just keep running. JavaScript will run and just try its best. Python, when it comes to an uh, UTF-8 decoding error, it's just going to crash and give you this error. But we can get around this. I'm going to switch over to bad. This, I'm reading the bytes and then converting it to a string. This one should decode, should at least do something. So I read the bytes in binary mode, converted it to a string, and then wrote the bytes of that string, or uh, encoded. So I'm decoding and re-encoding, and then wrote them to the second file. And I got a broken image. I just broke my image apart. So the bytes of this image are going to be you know, whatever bytes whatever they, they're going to be to encode this image. Those bytes, barring some absolute coincidence of cosmic magnitude, are not all going to be valid ASCII characters. So it's not going, or UTF-8 characters. So the bytes aren't either going to start with a leading zero, or they have to start with two leading ones, then a zero, and then the next byte has to start with one zero, or a byte starts with two, uh, three leading ones and a zero, and then the next two bytes start with one zero, or uh, the first byte starts with four leading ones, then a zero, and then the next three bytes start with one zero. The image that just has whatever bytes its encoding dictates isn't going to follow that exact structure with very high probabilities. Maybe somewhere out there there's an image that just happens to decode to valid UTF-8, Super unlikely, it's so extremely unlikely that I wouldn't be surprised if it never happened ever. So we get corruption. We get decoding errors. We can't represent this as a string. So Python, in this case, when we use the string constructor, just kind of does its best to convert that into a string, uh, but doesn't really do a good job. We encode it back into a file, and our file is corrupted. Our image is corrupted. We don't get the initial bytes back. All we're doing is encoding, uh, decoding using UTF-8, and then encoding using UTF-8. You would think you'd get your original bytes back. You don't, because this isn't valid UTF-8. It's however the bytes are in the image. Never, ever convert your images into strings or any multimedia file. Anything that's not a string, never convert it to a string, at least not this way. Uh, we can use base64 encoding. That's something we'll briefly talk about later in the semester. But Never just straight up convert them to strings. You're going to get decoding errors. You're going to get corrupt files. Nothing's going to work. Do we have, I mean, I gotta save at least a few minutes for the, I mean, is it going to help if I just rush the, the thing again? Let me try it. Let's do a little bit of this database example. I want to show you. Oops. 
hopefully my container's still running. Yeah, my container's still running from, from Wednesday. Uh, so let's talk about this at least a little bit so I can at least explain, give some context to what I did very briefly at the end of the last lecture. I have my app running, and I have my database container running. So if I want to get into one of these containers, let's actually jump into this one first. I'm going to do Docker exec for execute. Dash IT, which I still, uh, I keep forgetting what IT, those, there's two separate flags that were given this program. I always forget what they mean. I always think of IT like I'm uh, information technology because I have to get into this thing. That's how I remember it. Uh, I'm going to paste what I copied right here, the image ID. And then I'm going to say bin bash. So what this is saying is execute this program in this container. And bin bash, that's your shell. So this says, take me to the shell. Take me into the terminal inside this container. And oh, come on. Leading slash. Forgot my leading slash. So if this takes me into the container. And then I can look around and see that it did copy all of my files into this container. If I look at my present working directory, I should see slash root, because that's what I set it to in my Docker file. And I can look around. If your app writes files, uh, you could check to make sure those files are being written. You can you know, navigate the container and do you know, whatever you want to do in here. So let's exit this one. And let's do the same thing, but I want to enter my database container. Now, the database, it's not going to have anything of real import to me but uh, in its file structure, but it will have the database. I can enter Mongo and get into Mongo's shell. I can see the databases that I have. Oops, databases. I can use the use keyword that's going to switch to one of these databases. I'm going to switch to the CC312 database, show my collections. I have these two collections, one for the user ID and one for the, all the users. Do db dot whatever collection I want to access. And then I can use any MongoDB commands I want. I'm just going to use find all to show me everything. I can find all. Uh, so we did this thing in the code example. Oh, geez. If I can type. Uh, underscore ID zero. So this will give me everything except the underscore IDs. So that's what I'm going to get in the code when I say, give me everything, but don't give me those underscore IDs. I don't want them. I'm not concerned with them. Uh, we can insert data if we want to you know, hard code some things. We can play with our database and make sure everything is working the way we want it to work by doing this. All right. So I got, once you do the lecture question, you can go. We did get through everything I wanted to do, so call that a success.